The Goulton board, invented in 1876 by the Victorian genius Sir Francis Goulton, presents an elegant demonstration of how a normal distribution arises from the combination of a large number of random events. It provided Goulton with key insights into the distribution of human characteristics during his studies on heredity. It also played a pivotal role in his development of statistical theory, concepts that remain fundamental today. The distribution forms as beads navigate their way through a forest of pegs, arranged so that each time a bead hits a peg, it's randomly deflected to the left or the right with equal likelihood. This means there are many different possible paths a bead can take before it exits the pattern and comes to rest in one of the bins below. If you have a look at the middle of the pattern, you'll see there are lots of different pathways that take the beads to the middle bins. The further out you go, the fewer pathways there are. There's so many combinations, so when you've got 12 rows of pegs, to get to the middle two bins, there's actually 462 different paths you can take to get through there compared to the single path you can take to get to the extreme outside bins. But there's more to these numbers than that. There's a pattern here, and it's one of the most famous in all of mathematics, Pascal's Triangle. A number pattern steeped in history, the triangle has been studied for millennia. So we start from one, and basically you will go on both sides of the triangle with a succession of ones. But in the middle you will have values which are the sum of the two previous uh, values above, and so on. So you quickly see how the pattern develops. And it's the exact same pattern of numbers that we get when counting the pathways a bead can take as it descends the Galton board. And that's because the bead's journey is a binomial process. And the numbers in Pascal's triangle correspond to the coefficients of a binomial expansion. The binomial distribution itself comes from doing a series of what are called Bernoulli trials. So these are effectively just flips, flips of a coin, uh, heads or tails, yes or no, zero or one. Combine a number of these individual Bernoulli trials and you end up getting this binomial distribution. This distribution has a really nice link to what's called the binomial expansion. So if you take the expression x plus y to the power of n, uh, where n is just some integer, some whole number, and you can expand that out. It's just multiplying x plus y by itself n different times. So you can write that out and you can get expressions like x to the n, x to the n minus 1 times y, x to the n minus 2 times y squared, and so on, all the way down to the other end where you have y to the n. Now each one of these terms will have a number in front of it, a coefficient, which tells you how many times that quantity, say x to the n or x to the n minus 1 times y, appears when you do this expansion. And those coefficients are exactly these binomial coefficients. The bi in binomial refers to the fact that we have these two quantities, x and y, that we're doing an expansion of. The coefficients aren't just theoretical though, they have a practical use as well. Binomial coefficients are typically used to find the number of different, different ways of choosing a certain number of objects from, from a larger group of objects. This is the mathematics of, of combinatorics. So for example, if I've got four people and I want to make a team of two people, I might want to know how many different ways there are of choosing two people out of this group of four. And the binomial coefficient will tell me that there are actually six ways of doing this. And these, these binomial coefficients can be simply read off from the relevant row of Pascal's triangle. So if I'm looking at four people, then I look at the fourth row. Of, I look at the second element that isn't a one, so this is the first element, this is the second element, the six, and the six tells me that there are six ways of choosing two people from a larger group of four. These combinatorics are very useful indeed when dealing with probabilities. For example, if I'm thinking about flipping a coin, say 11 times, I want to know what's the probability that I get two heads. So I have to think of all the different sequences of, of flips of coins, head on the first flip or tail on the first flip, head on the second flip, tail on the second flip, or so on. 
uh, and I need to think of all the different ways that I can get two heads in, in those positions. So, so I need to know the number of ways of choosing two items from 11 items, and that's exactly this binomial coefficient, which I can read off directly from Pascal's triangle. It turns out there are 55 different ways that you can pick the positions of these two heads out of these 11 flips of the coin. If I then divide that by the total number of possible permutations, then I can calculate the probability of, of two heads in this flips of 11 coins being roughly 3%. But how do we know the total number of permutations? Well, the triangle has the answer to that as well. This is Pascal's triangle constructed of 12 different rows, so this would be row 0 up here, all the way down to 11. The total number of different possibilities of flips of the coin will be given by adding the numbers on the nth row. If I'm flipping a coin three times, how many different possible ways are there of doing that? Well, there's 1 plus 3 plus 3 plus 1 gives you a total of eight. Looking at the second row, then that's how many different combinations I can have of flipping two coins. One plus two plus one gives me four. Flipping a coin once, then there are only two possible outcomes. I can have head or tail. As I go down, I can start to see a pattern emerging. These are all the powers of two. Flipping the coin four times, if I add these numbers up, I find that there are 16 different ways of doing that. That's two to the four. Then two to the five, 32, 64 ways, 128, 256, 512, 1024. And then by the time we're flipping the coin 11 times, there are actually 2,048 different permutations of heads and tails that can come up. And this is precisely what's happening in our Galton board with its 12 rows of pegs. It's completely analogous to, to flipping uh, the coins heads or tails. In the, in the same way, we can look at the, the Galton board and try to ask, well, what's the probability that each bead will end up in a particular bin? If I have 11 rows, well, each time a bead hits this peg, it's the same as asking, do I flip a head or do I flip a tail? It's a binary choice. In effect, the total number of paths through the Galton board is 2 to the 11, which is 2048. So I have to just take the number of paths that I can, that I can use to get to that particular bin and divide by the total number of possible paths. So, for example, if I'm thinking of, of one of the middle two bins, then I say there are 462 different paths to get to that column, and I divide it by the total number of paths to snake its way through the Galton board, which is 2048, and I divide 462 by 2048 to find the probability that an individual ball will land in a given bin roughly a quarter of the time and, and if I add both of those middle bins together then it's roughly half the time I'd expect to find a bead in one of these middle two bins. There are mathematical uh, formula for, for these binomial coefficients but if you have Pascal's triangle then you can work them all out for yourself. It's a really nice system which you can just put on top of the Galton board and you can see exactly how many beads you would expect to make their way through to each one of these bins and as we've already seen it, it ends up looking like this beautiful normal distribution. In a sense then, the Galton board can be viewed as a dynamic version of Pascal's triangle. The number pattern emerging out of the various interweaving paths the beads take on their journey. Truly math in motion. If you would like your own Galton board for use in your school, museum, office or even at home, then go to galtonboard.com.